Divinity Original Sin 2 is a game that, for me anyway, completely came out of nowhere. I guess I had heard of, but just never played any of the other games in the Divinity series. But when Original Sin 2 came out in 2017, it seemed to be like everywhere I looked, dude. YouTube, Twitch, I had friends playing it and recommending it to me, and I would go take a look at the user reviews, and I mean the game looked really damn good. Now I vaguely remembered that the first game in this series was called Divine Divinity, which is a funny ass title. So when I saw that this one was Divinity Original Sin 2, I kind of shied away at first, to be honest. I mean, this seemed to be a sequel to a reboot of the original Divinity. I felt like I had a ton of catching up to do if I wanted to really enjoy this new mysterious game. I mean, imagine if your friends invited you to see a movie called The Return of the Glove 4, and you know, you hadn't caught the first three. But this was not the case at all as I would soon find out. And I just want to make it clear that this entire review is coming from someone who is not necessarily a Divinity fan, but a newcomer entirely. Curiosity eventually got the best of me, and I pulled the trigger. I was hungry for that feeling of being lost in a new game, especially an RPG. And I'll be damned, this game nearly ruined my life. I was working two jobs at the time, one at like a sports photography place and one at a museum, and neither establishment would get my best effort for at least like three weeks straight, I think even longer than that. Charming writing, great characters, deep and sandboxy combat, I mean I was just completely sucked in, like few games have sucked me in in the past. There is enough here to satisfy every RPG fan from casual to masochistic. So welcome everyone to my review. If you liked the video, please do like it below, and if you think I'm a dumbass and want to disagree with me, don't hesitate to comment just that. And of course, subscribe for more videos that are just like this one. And just a quick side note, I'm getting over a little cold, my voice sounds a little high and froggy, so pardon me, and let's enjoy the review. So Divinity is a tactical turn-based CRPG developed by Larian Studios, a smaller studio based in Belgium that have pumped out every previous game in this series, with this entry being the official fifth mainline game released. And while Original Sin 2 shares a universe with Original Sin 1, you do not need to have played it to follow along by any stretch, though there are some fun shoutouts and tie-ins for fans of the original Original Sin to enjoy. And I was actually very surprised to learn somewhat recently that the game was funded on Kickstarter. It had various development things tied to funding goals and it smashed, I mean smashed, all of them. Raising over two million dollars, well clear of their 500,000 overall goal. The Kickstarter was first posted in 2015 and then the game launched in 2017, so I mean that has to be one of the greatest success stories for any video game on Kickstarter because I think we all know there have been some disasters on that platform. Divinity ends up being a pretty long and involved gaming experience. I mean, it comes in the form of five acts, and it isn't uncommon for a first playthrough to take close to like 100 hours if you're really taking your time, doing side quests, exploring, and so on. And although this is a tactics game, there is a heavy emphasis on story. But I don't necessarily mean like a sweeping main quest line that's super engaging, but little stories, literally everywhere. Tons of character and charm propped up big time by the fantastic narrator voice that accompanies you throughout the entire experience. Mabel snorts, but you can see that she's fuming. Rivalon is a world of fairly typical high fantasy. You got your humans, your elves, your dwarves, oh, and giant lizard people who breathe fire, no big deal. And in this world, there's a special kind of magic known as source. The source is like the world energy of Rivalon, and using this power is very difficult. Those who are able to tap into it are known as sorcerers. And for generations, source was seen as a boon to society. It brought great knowledge and power, and was wielded by kings and simple healers alike. But at some point there, the source was tainted. Channeling the world's energy instead became something to be feared, a dark art that summoned dangerous void spawn along with it, terrorizing society. Now this eventually led to those who could naturally channel source being seen as serious threats to everyday life. Even children and the elderly who had the innate ability were hunted down by the divine order and their magister enforcers. Now this is the point where the game actually takes place. Both you and your other key characters are all sorcerers of different backgrounds from different lands, arrested for channeling, and put aboard a vessel headed for Fort Joy, a prison where you and your kind are collared and muted of their abilities. A sort of rehab center, you could say. So it is up to you to either go forth alone or interact with your fellow heroes and craft a party of four to find a way out of the prison and fulfill your destiny, baby. 
And although there are some big serious themes in this game, Rivalon is chock full of humor and charm. You have everything from people that have been turned into cows, talking skeletons full of riddles, Sir Laura the Squirrel Knight who rides around a skeleton cat, I mean just tons of character. This is far from any sort of gloom and doom setting, that's for damn sure. So this is the basic premise and setup, and this is where your story begins. So onwards to adventure, right? Not really, because first the hardest part of the entire game. Ah oh, yes, the dreaded character creation screen. No, I'm not even kidding. This really is the hardest part of the entire game for me. I mean, everything just looks so fun, so cool, so different from each other. I mean, you could be a skeleton dwarf, a lizard man, but wait, what are all these characters with names? Now, I was kind of confused my first time, so I just created a custom skeleton man and went on my merry way. But these named characters, known as origin characters, are a huge part of the experience, and in my opinion, the game is made much better by selecting one of them as your protagonist. Now, this can be seen as a pretty good thing, because on one hand, narratively, embodying one of them completely changes the lens in which you view the story, and which three you decide to surround yourself with to form your party of four further hammers out which story threads will be followed and which will be mostly ignored. The character stories are varied and extremely well written, giving the game tons of replay value just on exploring each of these origin characters alone. But I also honestly view this as a personal somewhat negative. In RPGs, I really enjoy character creation. I want to be able to be anybody, and it's up to me in my head how I fit into the world and into the story. Even amazing RPGs like the Witcher series that have a pre-written, pre-voice acted, and determined character arc kind of leave something to be desired for me. I really want this to be like my story, my creation, and Divinity just doesn't totally scratch that specific itch for me. So my first playthrough on that custom skeleton boy was great, I had a great time, but my second was on the origin character Ifan Ben Mezd, and I was honestly shocked at how much more personal the stakes were and unique things that people would say to me. It just felt like I had missed out on kind of the intended experience my first time through. And I know others online have shared this sentiment, so if there's anyone watching this who hasn't played the game yet, just hasn't finished it, I strongly recommend going with an origin character just for that first playthrough if you really want to feel like you're a part of the story. And although they do come pre-created and voiced, you could totally customize their starting class. You can even change their appearance. So. This is probably less of an issue for you than it was for me. Now for the characters themselves. And while they're all quite enjoyable to me, there are definitely some that are better than others. So I thought I would just quickly kind of power rank them from worst to best in my opinion as far as who should be your main character. So bringing up the rear, number six is Beast. Hmm. I was just thinking about someone I used to know. It breaks my heart, truly, to put the dwarf at the bottom. I love dwarves, and I really do love this guy specifically. But when compared to the other options here, Beast seems like kind of an afterthought. He's a hard-living pirate with family ties to some royalty and a very interesting character in theory, but his personal storyline just isn't the most satisfying or relevant to the main events of the game and the game world. I do, however, love to recruit him as a member of my party because his design and voice acting is just spectacular, even if he is a little bit vanilla. His default class is a battle mage, and I mean, it's hard to skip out on the dwarf, man. Number five is Sebel. This is the edgy elf rogue archetype, and she's fine. I know a lot of people really like her, and I think her personal storylines are compelling, but overall just feels like a character I have seen before in other games, many times. A freed slave with a real big chip on her shoulder, understandably, and a lot of tension to channel into some activities, so she naturally takes up stabbing as that activity. And sort of like Beast, she just doesn't really feel like a main character for a playthrough for me, like, ever. More of a supporting presence at best. I just never really find revenge arcs to be all that fun to control, but, you know, certainly fun to watch go down. I will make the master sing a very different kind of song. Number four is Ifan Ben Mezd. Now, this dude is awesome. 
absolutely main character material with an extremely relevant personal quest line. Playing as Ifan totally immerses you in the story, especially early on in the first two or so acts. He's a smooth-talking, rugged wayfarer who once served the Divine Order, but he's now a mercenary killer and has tons of PTSD and stuff, and just great personal reasons to be involved with everything happening in the world. I think it's hard to go without Ifan during a playthrough as well. He's just a great presence. Now I'm a mercenary killer. One of the infamous Lone Wolves. And my next target is none other than Lucian's own son. Number three is the Red Prince. What an absolute lad the Red Prince is, dude. Famed, of course, for my unique red skin and unparalleled skills as a general of the House of War, I, the Red Prince, was raised within the vast palaces of the fabled Forbidden City. Pompous, pretentious, rude, royal, bearded dragon who also happens to be a fierce warrior. He's naturally inclined to be a fighter stuck in the middle of the action, and he just has an amazing story arc. It's always really fun for me to see him warm up to you over time and start treating you like a friend opposed to a servant if he isn't your main character. I mean, he to me is probably the most fun character to have around. He's always got something to say, and his uniqueness as a big red lizard definitely helps. I mean, simply put, this is kind of the character I think of when I think of Divinity. Number two is Losa. Now, Losa has some incredible writing and character development. Her personality is really believable, if that makes sense. She's super charming and honest and kind, but has a dark secret in the form of a demon that has partial control of her mind. The storyline is definitely the most memorable to me as far as the main character and explores all sorts of dark themes like loneliness, abuse, self-worth. I mean, it sounds corny as all hell, but Losa really did surprise me. Her default class is an enchanter and that ties into her story really smoothly as well. Just overall a great character. You can trust me. I've got this under control. <laughs> and finally, we have Fane. Oh, don't stare. How would you look after eons in some ghastly crypt? Your people are rather prone to death. Mine are not. The greatest character in the entire game, a goddamn ancient skeleton man who's also a pompous and pretentious twat just like the Red Prince. But this is really, in my opinion, the true main character of this game. His personal story is incredibly mysterious and has the most relevant arc in relation to the main quest. His interactions with other characters also just feel the most fleshed out and appropriate. His entire character is based on the fact that he is this ancient, ancient skeleton, and the world is not his. He's perplexed by the ways of the people in this land, so it's a really nice self-insert for a main character. We are also a visitor in a strange land as the player. And oh yeah, he's a skeleton, so I mean, come on, he's the best one. Now with all the origin and stuff out of the way, I want to talk writing and a little bit of voice acting. I think one of, if not the biggest draw to Divinity is its writing. From the very first cutscene, there is a whimsical quality to everything. A magical hum. I mean, it feels like curling up by the fire with a giant storybook that just completely whisks you away. The key here, I think, is the overwhelming amount of influence from tabletop games, and specifically Dungeons and Dragons. Now, for anyone who has experience with any sort of tabletop, I'm sure you would agree that there is nothing quite like sitting face to face with your friends and just getting super immersed during a campaign. But I can say with confidence that this game is the closest I have ever experienced to having that experience by myself. No question about it. Just simple dialogue with a merchant to talking to magical statues, talking to rats, talking to nasty ass griff, Everything has a level of quality that does not really dip. The writing is quick, it's smart, and it's very efficient. I mean, it's so common in RPGs especially that are meant to immerse you, to barrage the player with walls of text. But Divinity, I think, does a great job with showing and not telling. You're never going to be put to sleep during an interaction, like ever. I think a massive amount of credit in this department has to go to the casting and performances of the various voice actors. Each origin character boasts nearly spotless performances. I mean, the kind of voice acting that is so good, you kind of don't even notice it anymore, if that makes sense. Then you have basic enemies like the Magisters with pretty solid voices, which keeps the immersion intact. It's a register, sir. Good, good. Magister Williams is just about done with the last passenger. But the star of the show, nay, 
the star of the entire video game has got to be the narrator. My good lord, man. You walk towards the figure on the dice, but wisps of mist start to cloud your vision. With each step, the mist gets thicker, hiding the figure from sight. Dingtail reaches into his pocket and fishes out an orange, telling you it is in pieces of fruit that he hid his contraband. He devours it greedily, and his eyes begin to glaze. A yawn, a few mumbled words, and the lizard falls asleep. You sit in the sand, close your eyes, and follow him. Brian Bowles, if that's how you say your name, and you're out there. Thank you, sir. Thank you. So for all my ranting and raving about the writing being so good, I do have a confession to make. I don't love the main plot all too much, and it's kind of hard for me to exactly pin down why that is. Maybe it's just that I had played too many RPGs right around this time that I first discovered Divinity and it felt a little vanilla. I mean, it starts really strong. Act 1 in Fort Joy is so tight, but as the acts wear on, things kind of just start to fall away from me. If you've watched my channel at all before, you'd know that I adore story in games. It's kind of the entire basis of the channel, really. But I just never really got fully hooked by the overarching set pieces here. Though I do admit, maybe if I had played all the previous games in the Divinity series, I'd be a little more into it. I don't know. I definitely would say, though, that by the game's end, I am properly invested in what's happening, so maybe it's just a zigzagging path for me to get there. There's also legitimately a lot of quality stuff that's distracting me from the main quest line. It's hard for me to stay focused, but I think the redeeming aspect to my point is that you're bound to love something here regarding the story, be it really big or really small. Now let's talk music and ambience for just a moment, because I think this is where Divinity is hugely underrated. The score was done by Borislav Slavov, and it's full of really beautiful stuff with a ton of variation. And Mr. Slavov, I gotta give you one big medal of honor, sir. Now again, if you've watched any of my other videos, you might know that I hate combat music. In almost every video game, it's usually bombastic and super jarring when it cuts in, but the combat music in Divinity? is really damn good. I mean, I like it. It's appropriately kind of thumping along. Also, that basic combat theme, as well as a few other pieces, have different lead instruments based on your choice in character creation. It gives your characters kind of this flavor and sound through the entire thing, which I think is really cool and really unique. That extra work done by the music team really does make a difference. The ambient sounds are all very decent as well, but in certain towns, the lines that certain NPCs will just continue to speak over and over again are very likely to make you lose your mind. Smells worse over here than a dozen rotten eggs dropped in a vat of vinegar. Then don't come over. Not like you're buying anything. If I don't come visit your tongue, who will? Two seconds later. Smells worse over here than a dozen rotten eggs dropped in a vat of vinegar. Now to the art style. This is somewhat of a mixed bag for me. So as good as I think the game looks and as rich as some of the environments are, I honestly find some of the characters to look dumpy and lame unless they are in like heavy armor, especially the humans. But on the other hand, the lizards look insanely cool in pretty much everything and very unique. So, you know. I think this is also partly from the setting being a little vanilla fantasy, which isn't a bad thing, but this is a very D&D-esque world with knights, wizards, castles, dungeons, and so on. I mean, it would have been cool to see some like really out there stuff as far as visual variety over the 200 hours, but I wouldn't say it is bad by any stretch. And of course, there's a continuity to keep as far as the look of the previous games in the series, which I have stated several times that I haven't played all of. I will say though that all the animations for running, moving, using abilities, everything's nice and tight, so at least there's nothing that really takes you out of the action visually. I think mostly my wishes weigh on just wanting my human rogue characters to not look like the Michelin Man. Come on, man. Anyway, moving on. So regardless of which origin character you pick, what party you decide to assemble, you will quickly find yourself in combat. So how are you going to build these characters? What are they going to do in combat? Well, there are so many different ways to build characters in Divinity, but it really all comes down to your attributes, combat and civil abilities, and talents. So let's begin with attributes, because this is going to look very familiar to anyone who's played an RPG. Strength, finesse, intelligence, constitution, 
All very straightforward. Memory, which just kind of constitutes how many spells or skills you can equip at a given time. And finally, wits, which affects your critical strike chance, your initiative in combat, and most fun, your chances of finding hidden stuff out in the world. All of these attributes, though, are much more than just stats, because you're going to have opportunities to check these skills against events in the game. Say, to move a heavy object in your way, to persuade someone one way or the other, and with wits, you're going to be able to find things like hidden levers or buttons that grants you access to shortcuts or hidden areas with ease. How you build your protagonist and your party of four is really going to open certain doors and possibly close others, adding to the replayability big time. I think it works really well, and it's rather straightforward. But if I had one negative thing to say about attributes, it's that it kind of feels like on something like a mage character, I'm just pumping intelligence to the cap. I kind of wish they had more interplay. Like if you're playing a mage character, constitution could affect your magical armor a little bit, or just something like that. So next is combat abilities. Now combat abilities are where the fun and flavor really starts to come into play. It's also worth noting now that when you're making your character, you pick a starting class which has a pre-built sheet, but you can edit literally everything about it to fine tune it to your liking and essentially make a custom class. Now there's no point in going super in depth with all of these, but you have a wide array of options. There are weapon combat abilities, defensive combat abilities, which is tanky stuff like group wide dodge and a thorns effect, and then the skills. And this is the good stuff, baby. You got everything from wind magic, earth magic, bow high ground damage, water magic, necromancy, polymorph skills, fire magic, roguish abilities, summoning, and then warfare. Leveling up these skills unlocks certain combat skills for use, but it also gives you some sort of passive. For instance, with necromancy, taking points gives you a lifesteal effect every time you deal direct damage. And then something like warfare just boosts your flat physical damage. And this gives a bit more depth than I think first meets the eye. There's also fantastic synergy built in here between schools of magic and so on. If you take water and wind magic, you can cover the battlefield in puddles and then shock the ground, giving everyone that little zap zap. Or if you're a madman, take geomancer and pyromancer, cover the world in oil and then explode the entire thing. Kill yourself, your party, your enemies, everything. This is where the sandbox really invites you in to get creative and experiment. And my god. The possibilities are exciting. Each category leads to tons and tons of abilities to be used, and even some that are kind of mashups, requiring points in two different things to be wielded. An example is Blood Rain, which needs some Hydrosophist skill as well as Necromancy. Again, my only complaint here is that it can get a tiny bit stale for certain builds. I mean, if you're specializing in any sort of physical damage, you're going to end up dumping a ton into Warfare even if you don't use a single warfare skill, just for that flat physical damage buff. But anyway, moving on to civil abilities. So here you have things like bartering, lucky charm, lore master, telekinesis, sneaking, thievery, and persuasion. This is more of the flavor section, right? But it's more important than you'd think when you're building out your whole party of four. I always try to have a little bit of everything, especially persuasion, bartering, and lore master. But as you get more comfortable with the game and its mechanics, these can be really fun to just mess around with, especially telekinesis. So finally we have the talents, and these are things that really change how your character functions, mostly in combat. Everything from being able to talk to animals, extending your grenade throw range, smelling really really bad, exploding upon death, the list goes on. And these are really fun to try to puzzle into your chosen build. And in some instances, make or break the efficacy of an entire playstyle. So there's a ton of fun to be had in here. Again, only one complaint. Now this really bugs me, man. Pet Pal. Being able to talk to animals should just be baseline. There's so much incredible dialogue and humor to be missed if you don't take it, but it eats up a precious early game talent slot. Thankfully, there's a mod for that which is added in free of effort or charge with the Definitive Edition. But I think activating those mods turns off achievements on Steam, so that's kind of annoying if that's important to you. So that is a lot of variety. 
and you can imagine that the internet is full of interesting builds and things to try out for yourself. I strongly recommend Fexter Life as a resource. They have tons of fun stuff to mess around with. I really like the Sanguine Archer build, the uh, Frost Paladin, and the Geomancer. Those are really, really cool. But I think the real enjoyment I get out of this whole system is how I'm going to take this big mess of information, multiply it by four, and create a cohesive unit that will be effective together. Because synergy is just everything in Divinity. Add in the fact that you unlock source abilities throughout the game as well, which are super powerful skills you want to save for just the right moment in combat. And man, it's legitimately just endless fun. Thankfully, you won't be punished too hard if you really mess up your characters early on, because you just gotta get to Act 2, and there's this mirror on your boat. Here you can rearrange your skill points, talents, everything, even change your appearance. I really, really love this addition. They knew that people would probably regret some of those early ignorant choices, and the game loses none of its potency by allowing you to respec. Good job, Larry, and everybody else take notes. Turn-based tactical combat and battlefield management has always been something I very much enjoy. I honestly don't think there is a single encounter in this game that I don't have fun with. I mean, there are certainly some questionable fights as far as design, like the notorious Black Pits showdown, but even when things are kind of busted, I'm still enjoying myself somehow. But I don't want to use my insanity as an excuse to overlook a handful of poorly designed fights. I think they are very few and far between, but some can really be stinkers that are going to force you to take a bunch of breaks and maybe just come back to the game in a day or two with a fresh perspective. I think personally, I really like games that allow you to take all the tools you have been given and just go insane. Because here in Divinity, if you know what you're doing, you can master the elements to completely control the battlefield, even with funky, weird, experimental builds. Now, it's kind of funny, but I think the highest points combat-wise for me are really early in the game, when you don't yet have a full tool belt of things to reach for. You're scraping and clawing your way through each fight, trying to use the environment and maximize the use of your, like, two skills you already have. It's not to say at all that the middle and late game fights are weak, because that could not be further from the truth. Having that full arsenal with a well thought out build can lead to some insane combos that are immensely satisfying to pull off. I think what I'm trying to say is that battle almost never feels like a chore, but it also doesn't feel like the real meat of what I'm waiting for. Divinity somehow balances the slower paced sections where you're just chugging through dialogue and these epic fights. There are also hilarious ways you can sort of exploit the game and create insanely broken things to destroy your enemies. Again, like any good RPG, the freedom is given to us to kind of push the limits of what is possible. This gives the main gameplay loop of combat a shit ton of replayability, challenge run options, and that sandboxy feel. It's just great. Crafting is yet another rabbit hole to lose yourself in with Divinity. I mean, you can craft many, many items here, but I was quickly overwhelmed, to be honest, with all of the possibilities. I mean, you can make grenades, item scrolls, create unlockable skills, potions, food, armor, enchanting stuff, runes, etc. Now for context, crafting is not something I usually leap to explore. I usually kind of don't enjoy it that much, but Divinity changed me, man. You can do some insane things in this game. Beyond just the list of makeables, there are some super top secret classified recipes, which I will let you in on, but please don't tell anyone. Now, one of my favorites is simply combining two smaller potions into one big one and continue that with the next size up. It keeps a ton of that early game loot relevant that's sitting in your bags, so you can end up combining all these little baby potions into one giant big ass juicy. You can also, say, grab some leather scraps, some rope, and make extra backpacks to carry your stuff. Combine nails and your current boots, and you won't slip on ice in combat. Make lockpicks with either a hammer and a nail, or soap and a key. Or hey, grab some silverware that's plated in gold, combine it with pixie dust and water to make thunder runes. Or just grab a knife and any kind of pillow, and you're gonna get feathers. You can make new arrows with them. I mean, I could go on and on, and I'm sure there's tons that I don't even know. This system is expansive and meant to be fiddled with. It rewards you for experimenting, which I think is also a sign of a well-designed and implemented feature. But the game also doesn't mind if you completely ignore crafting. You can get along just fine without it, which I also really like. Now I want to briefly talk about multiplayer experience with Divinity Original Sin 2, which is pretty damn good. 
It's as simple as starting a campaign, opening your game lobby for friends, and they can just join right up. Simple as that. With the turn-based combat, things work flawlessly in battle, and it can be a blast to organize an attack plan with a couple pals, building your characters to have a certain synergy and complementary skills. One place for me though where it stumbles a tiny bit is the narrative sections where players are exploring, say, a new location. You and your buddies just rolled into town and inevitably scatter all around looking for vendors to sell your junk and talk to people, whatever. But if a key story thing is occurring, it will only be occurring for the player who happened to encounter it. They will have to wait for all the homies to come over and click the little ear thing so they don't miss of some of what's happening. I'm not even necessarily sure how you could fix this issue, to be honest, without kind of messing up the flow of the open world, but it just kind of bugs me. I don't know. Feels like you as a party kind of have to keep really tight together if you have any interest in the NPC interactions. But that being said, I think multiplayer works best if everyone playing has just never played the game ever. You can all stick together, uncover quests and secrets as a unit. And if this is an option for your your first playthrough, I say go for it. So the definitive edition of Divinity Original Sin 2 launched sometime after the vanilla, and now that the game is sort of complete, it's worth mentioning some of the other features outside of the main game. Now the first noteworthy mode is Arena. This is sort of a combat-only gauntlet. There is a solo mode, an online multiplayer PvP, and a couch co-op. It is sort of cool to be able to control some of these characters from the story for the first time here, and it can be a decent temporary fun thing to do, but definitely not something I have felt a desire to dump much of my time into. But there is a pretty impressive 13 maps across two game modes, so if you really enjoy the combat and want to just beat your friends' asses, this is definitely the place. The other game mode which is really interesting to me is Game Master. Now this is nuts, dude. They include an entire campaign builder with all of the game assets, including the extras. You can take the tabletop inspiration to an entirely new level and use the engine as your game world. Now, I've never used it for this purpose, but the depth and amount of options here just seems staggering. For people who are really into carefully crafting a campaign to experience with friends, this is like an absolute dream. Now, all of this massive game, 200 plus hours, tons of content, these extra modes, the multiplayer, this is often on sale for like 20, 40 bucks, which is just insane to me. It also goes on sale on consoles pretty regularly for less, and apparently it controls really well on a controller, so I mean the ease of access is just excellent. Now for the verdict. Divinity Original Sin 2 is a very special game. It surprised me totally with its quality, its detail, its depth, but it also has had serious staying power years later as a game I regularly revisit solo or with friends. It isn't perfect, of course, no game is, with my main issues being ones of personal taste with the overall story and some common RPG issues, but I think this game easily deserves a spot in anyone's library who enjoys grand adventure type RPGs or tactical combat especially if you enjoy both. The ramping up of the difficulty options make it so literally anyone can enjoy a mostly balanced experience. I am going to give Divinity Original Sin 2 a score of 89. It's available on most consoles and PC, and you should definitely give it a try. I think it's very likely that you will love it. Thank you so much for watching this review, everyone. I appreciate all of you greatly. Shout out to the patrons. Pardon my voice again, getting over a little something. And let me know down in the comments what game you would like to see a review of next. Also, let me know your thoughts on the Divinity franchise. And how about that Baldur's Gate 3 Larian is now working on? Thank you again, everyone, and I will see you soon. Until next time, peace!